Okay, here we are at 101. We may give uh, people another minute or two. Um, I see some attendees still joining, so I'm going to, to mute and give a couple more minutes um, for people to join in, and then I'll start maybe, um, you know, at uh, in one more minute, we'll start at 103. Heather, you want to give me um, the screen? I have a couple of slides first, and then I'll okay, pass sure. it off to you sure. if that's okay. Okay, great. <clears throat> no, no problem. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start the webinar now. Thank you all for attending. Um, I am um, Heather Michelson, the Vice President of Operations here at DTC. I know that uh, if you have attended a webinar um, in the past, you have been hosted by a wonderful um, gentleman named Darren McHugh. You're stuck with me this time. <laughs> um, my contact information is on the screen, um, I hope. Uh, and uh, feel free to call me with any questions about this webinar or, or any webinar in the future. And I'm happy to um, be hosting Karen Pass um, today, whose information is now on the screen as well from In Unison Consulting. Um, uh, we, um, you know, hope to always add value to our clients um, in these webinars. Um, and this is, is a hot topic, obviously. Um, not only in dental, but in all um, the health industry, um, and certainly as pertains to IT as we grow. So um, Karen has been in the compliance industry for like 17 years, I think, over 17 years. She has experience in um, policy and procedure development. Um, she authors compliance blogs and articles um, to make sure her readers are kept up to date with the latest compliance news. She's even run a HIPAA compliance training session for us here at DTC. So, so trust me when I tell you that she does know what she's talking about, and uh, um, we have been very happy um, with her. Um, before I pass it off to her, I, I these are, like I said, supposed to be a value add to our clients, but I just want to be sure that you guys know all of the things that DTC provides. Um, you know, we do cloud backups. We do um, some HIPAA compliance um, uh, services, HIPAA compliance services. You know, we work with Karen pretty, pretty uh, tightly to make sure that your office is um, educated and that we are doing um, what what we need to do for you as an IT company. We also do VoIP phones. If you want to move from paper to paperless, we can help you with that. We've helped clients over the years with that. Um, we do have managed firewall services and we and we also do new office build out. So if you're thinking of doing that or know anybody who um, has plans to start a new office in the next um, couple of months, year or so, just let, um, let us know. We do an amazing job of, of that stuff um, as far as an IT company goes, getting involved in the beginning and helping you throughout the entire process. Um, I also want to sort of just um, point out to our blog um, at DTC, we do have a blog um, and uh, it's under our website, uh, under about is a blog. And so we add to it relatively frequently. We've got some, some good articles on here that we promote on our, um, on our social media. Um, I also, we have this great little campaign called Think Like Steve, where everybody shows you how they're like our owner, Steve McNamara. Um, it's a cute little, um, blog posts that we do, but the one I wanted to point out was this, um, the one that highlighted our partnership with Karen and, and um, in unison. Um, you can read through that, those details. There's, you know, nothing too, um, too complicated. We were doing some HIPAA 
um, audits for IT and our clients had um, bigger questions than we could answer, more process-based questions, business process questions, um, rather than IT questions, and, and uh, rather than pretend we knew something about something that we didn't know anything about, <laughs> we reached out to Karen, and um, she has agreed to you know work with anybody who asks us, and we're, like I say, we did a HIPAA audit, a compliance audit with her, with for our office, and we're real happy with um, with the services that she provides, and with her staff and her knowledge, and and uh, we have no no qualms about um, uh, you know passing our clients off to her. So um, um, real happy to have her with us today to talk about HIPAA compliance. It's not a topic that that you want to get stuck talking about, but I will um, of course pass off to Karen. Karen, if you um, are ready, I will try to change you to the sure. presenter and sure. see if that works out for you. Yay. And there you are. Is that good? Okay. Yep. I can see it. All right. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And thanks, Heather. And special thanks to DTC for hosting this webinar. And I also want to thank all of you out there for taking valuable time out of your lunch break to participate. My plan for today is to take what is a complicated topic and try to break it down into the why and how of conducting a HIPAA security risk analysis. So today's goals, what I'd like to do today is answer the following questions. Who is behind the HIPAA laws? What is a HIPAA security risk analysis? Why are we required to conduct one? When and how often do we need to complete a security risk analysis? How do we conduct one? And where do we find help? Heather, can you see that, that bar on the right-hand side? Is that interfering with the, um, the slides, what I'm seeing? No, I, I believe you can probably only see it on your screen. Okay, okay. I just and want to you make can sure also collapse it with that arrow, with that orange arrow. But I'm, I did, okay. I am glad that you paused for a second because I was supposed to tell people that if you had questions, you can put them in the chat box and we'll ask Karen the questions after um, after the webinar. So we'll let her do her thing. And then if you think of questions, you can type them in that chat box and I will uh, ask Karen. We'll leave some time for a, for a question and answer session afterwards. So. Thanks. Okay, sure. So what I thought would be a good idea is before we kind of dive into the, the HIPAA security risk analysis, it's a good idea to do a, just a quick review on, on the HIPAA laws. So the purpose of the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act is to set national standards to protect the privacy and confidentiality of patients' health information. When you're thinking about HIPAA, you need to consider that there's there are certain rules that fall under the HIPAA standards. So uh, let's start with the privacy rule. The privacy rule was established to help maintain the confidentiality of protected health information, or PHI, and applies to health plans, healthcare clearinghouses, and most healthcare providers. So uh, protected health information, PHI, it's probably worth stopping and defining that for a second. Examples of PHI include patient charts, whether they're electronic or on paper, EOBs, same thing, electronic or paper, full face photos. Another example of PHI would be radiographs identified with patient name, date, or other type of identifier. Next, we have the security rule. The, secur the security rule zeroes in on electronic protected health information, ePHI. While the privacy rule deals with PHI as a whole, it's really the electronic protected health information that falls under security. Next, we have breach notification. Breach notification requires practices to notify affected individuals, the Department of Health and Human Services, and sometimes even the media after a breach of unsecured PHI has happened. And here's another definition, secured PHI versus unsecured PHI. So in order to secure protected health information, it must be made unusable, unreadable, 
and indecipherable. The fourth rule under the HIPAA standards is your omnibus rule. And the omnibus rule is meant to strengthen patient privacy protection and provides patients with new rights to their PHI. And then lastly, we have enforcement rule. The purpose of the enforcement rule is to establish civil and criminal penalties for failure to comply with the HIPAA standards. Under enforcement, violations and privacy complaints are investigated by regulators from the Department of Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights, that's OCR. Criminal violations are referred to the Department of Justice. I think it's worth taking a minute to talk about the enforcement process. So as I said, the OCR enforces HIPAA privacy and security rules, and they do it by a, a certain means. They'll investigate complaints, they'll investigate breaches, or they'll even conduct random compliance reviews. As you can see, HIPAA violations can be pretty expensive. So the penalties for non-compliance are based on the level of negligence, and they can range anywhere from $100 to $50,000 per violation or per record. The, the uh, penalties max out at $1.5 million per calendar year, but that's only for multiple violations of a similar nature. I've seen OCR fines and penalties for multiple categories of violations reaching into the millions for some entities. And that's both large and small uh, providers, hospitals, other types of entities. The one thing I need to emphasize, especially uh, today, is the lack of, of a proper, properly conducted SRA is the, one of the most common violations found by the OCR. Okay, so let's talk about establishing a secure security program compliance, um, well, actually in compliance, so establishing a HIPAA security program. Um, there are certain pieces and components that you have to put together. The first thing you're gonna do is assign your security officer. The security officer's job is to implement your security program and oversee any uh, new aspects of the program and make sure that all your workforce members are in compliance. The next thing you're going to do is start your security risk analysis. And sometimes you'll hear it referred to as security risk assessment, pretty much the same thing. Next, you'll establish and implement written security policies and procedures. You'll conduct your employee training. And then you'll begin your HIPAA security risk management process. So let's talk about exactly what a HIPAA security risk analysis is, or an SRA. A, a HIPAA security risk analysis is a practice-specific assessment used to identify the potential risks and vulnerabilities to the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of electronic protected health information that you create, receive, maintain, or transmit. You need to remember when you're conducting your HIPAA security risk analysis, we need to keep in mind the implementation specifications. So you, so you must document these specifications. There's 49 of them you must document each one showing that they've been reviewed as they relate to your practice. And an implementation specification is just simply defined as the uh, specific HIPAA requirements that you must follow. I'll be sharing some examples of specifications as we go further along so you have an idea of exactly what I mean by that. When you're thinking about your uh, security standard implementation specifications, you also have to keep in mind whether or not they're required or addressable. Required specifications are mandatory, but addressable specifications give you flexibility, but it doesn't mean that the addressable specifications are optional. If you determine in conducting your security risk analysis that an addressable specification isn't reasonable and appropriate for you to implement, you must document why, 
and adopt an equivalent protective measure in its place. All right, so let's move on to your security risk management plan. Once you've conducted your SRA, you're going to approach your security risk management process. And a risk management plan involves creating and implementing policies and procedures that apply reasonable and appropriate safeguards to prevent, detect, contain, and correct anticipated threats to EPHI. In other words, your security risk management plan helps prioritize and mitigate the risks and vulnerabilities identified in your security risk analysis. So I've thrown out some terms so far and I'm going to expand on them. So I think it's important that I define what these particular terms mean. So we're gonna talk about vulnerability, we're going to discuss threat, and we're going to describe risk. So let's start with vulnerabilities. A vulnerability is a security flaw or weakness in your practice information system that could cause a security breach resulting in an inappropriate access to or disclosure of protected health information. As you can see on the slide, vulnerabilities include holes, flaws, or weaknesses in your IT system, a system that isn't configured or implemented in accordance with HIPAA standards, and ineffective or incorrect or non-existent policies and procedures. One thing when you've identified your vulnerabilities on your SRA and begin mitigation, you, you, um, one thing to do is think about checking with your IT support for help in mitigation. And if you're clients of DTC, they're a really great resource to go to when it comes to that. Next, we have threats. And a threat is defined as the potential that a vulnerability can be accidentally triggered or intentionally exploited. So you can see there's different types of threats, categories of threats, natural, environmental, and human. Natural threats include floods, earthquakes, tornadoes, uh, environmental threats would include a power failure or a computer crash, fire, chemical leak leakage. And then lastly, human threats can be either intentional or unintentional. So intentional actions might include network and computer-based attacks such as ra ransomware and viruses, um, theft, or unauthorized access to EPHI. And unintentional actions might include loss of portable electronic media, unauthorized use of mobile devices, or inaccurate data entry or deletion. Lastly, we have risk. Risk is defined as the likelihood that a threat could trigger or exploit a particular vulnerability and what will be the resulting impact on your practice. Keep in mind that risk is not a single event, but a combination of threats and vulnerabilities that could result in a security breach. All right, so let's identify the essential elements of a security risk analysis. The first thing you're gonna do is identify and document potential threats and vulnerabilities to your EPHI. So you're going to customize your security risk analysis depending on your circumstances and environment. But each specification, as I've said before, each specification must be evaluated to determine whether or not it applies to your practice. The next thing you're gonna do is assess current security measures. So you wanna take a look at the security measures you currently have in place to safeguard your EPHI and, and determine whether they're configured and used properly. You wanna determine the likelihood and impact of a threat. So once you've identified potential threats, and remember the threats include fire, ransomware attack, loss of a, or theft of a mobile device. Once you've identified these threats, you're going to determine what the effect would be to the confidentiality, confidentiality availability, and integrity of EPHI. The next thing you'll do is assign risk levels. The security rule requires risk levels to be applied for all threats and vulnerabilities identified during your SRA. 
This will help you prioritize your corrective steps. So documenting the risk levels and your corrective actions will help you mitigate the risks. Then the next step will be to develop your risk management strategy. So your risk management plan will help you outline and prioritize the corrective measures you'll be taking to mitigate your risks identified on your SRA. And then lastly, you're going to conduct a periodic review and updates to your security risk analysis. The risk analysis process should be ongoing. So the security rule requires your practice to continuously update your SRA. They, they, they kind of say as needed, but, but basically a good rule of thumb is your security risk analysis should be performed at least annually or more frequently if updates and changes te to technology and business operations are planned in your practice. If a security incident has been discovered or the practice has had a change in ownership or a turnover in key staff or management, or if existing security measures aren't uh, protecting against evolving threats, vulnerabilities, or changes within your business any longer. I've gotten this question in the past, is there a required security risk analysis form or template that the security rule requires you to use? And the answer is no. The security rule doesn't require the, you to use a specific format, method, or template for documenting your SRA. You do have flexibility depending on the size and complexity of your practice. But remember, when you're conducting your SRA, your security risk analysis, all the specifications must be evaluated and the findings documented on your security risk analysis, even if they don't apply. When it comes to past uh, security risk analyses, you, you need to make sure that you're keeping them for six years from the date of creation. And that really applies to all HIPAA documentation. So uh, uh, HIPAA policies and procedures, your business associate agreements, notice of privacy practices, contingency plan, everything that you do for your HIPAA uh, um, uh, policies and procedures and your HIPAA program, you do need to keep all that documentation for six years. All right, so we're close to performing a security risk analysis, but there's one thing we need to keep in mind um, uh, before we do so, and that is, is uh, remembering that the security standards had categories, and all the implementation specifications fall under one of these three categories. So you have your administrative safeguards, your physical safeguards, and your technical safeguards. We're going to start with your administrative safeguards, and, and basically the definition of, of those is that they are meant to focus on your internal policies, procedures, and security measures that you use to protect your PHI. So I said I was going to go over um, some examples of, of implementation specifications, so I'm going to um, kind of skip around and pick a few for time's sake and describe what they are. So let's start with your sanction policy. Your sanction policy helps you establish consequences for unauthorized or inappropriate access to PHI. So your sanction policy is basically going to um, describe for your workforce members uh, basically the do's and don'ts of handling and accessing PHI and what the consequences might be of inappropriate or unauthorized access or, or basically noncompliance with the HIPAA, HIPAA rules. IT system activity audit, that is supposed to help you regularly review records of information system activity, such as your audit logs or access reports. So you're going to follow your workforce members using their login credentials as to where they're going in your system, um, what they're accessing, what they're viewing, what they're modifying, what they're transmitting. And by doing so, you're going to be able to pick up any unauthorized activity. Training and security reminders, that, that it, uh, has to do with conducting your annual HIPAA training. And then also 
conducting periodic security updates and reminders of existing policies. So letting workers know uh, anything new out there, any new threats that, that have, as, uh, you've been made aware of that they need to know about. Also, perhaps reminding them of existing policies. Uh, a good example might be just uh, not to forget to, to log out of their workstation when they walk away and leave it unattended. Login monitoring uh, describes how you're going to uh, try to help identify unauthorized attempts to log into your system. And um, an example, the contingency plan example, that simply means contingency plan is procedures for protecting and recovering EPHI in the event of an emergency. And uh, emergency could cover any of any threats really, fire, power outage, system failure, uh, natural disaster. And when you're thinking about establishing your con contingency plan or being proactive in protecting your PHI, you're also going to consider the subplans that are listed under the contingency plan. Your data backup plan, your disaster recovery plan, your emergency mode operation plan, applications and data criticality analysis, and your testing and revision procedures. Your physical safeguards are meant to protect IT systems and related buildings and equipment from unauthorized intrusion, natural and environmental hazards. So let's pick out some specifications from, from that category. We'll talk about facility security and access control. So your facility security is meant to safeguard your facility equipment from unauthorized access tampering and theft. And, and the access control just helps to validate and control employee and visitor access to the practice in certain areas of the practice. So basically, you know who's in the building at any given time, who, have act, who has access to the building off-site. Maybe there's certain um, uh, equipment that you don't want everyone to have access to, uh, uh, and those areas are locked, the room, cabinets, uh, uh, filing cabinets, that type of thing. A good example of something that you wouldn't want ev just anyone and everyone to have access to would be your server. Workstation use and security. That specification wants you to take a look at all of your workstations and consider uh, how they're set up. So how are your screens positioned? Do you need to add screen protectors to, to uh, guard against unauthorized viewing? Do you have anybody working from home? Uh, so therefore, do you need to set up remote access procedures for them? Um, you want to take a look at all your workstations and determine which workstation has access to EPHI, which doesn't, and uh, um, maybe alter that if, if you need to. And then the last category are your technical safeguards. Technical safeguards are policies, procedures, and technology used to protect and control access to EPHI. So we can talk about your unique login credentials and authentication management when we're talking about your technical safeguards. So basically what that is, is, is establishing a process for creating, changing, and safeguarding usernames user passwords, user passphrases. Also considering uh, uh, adopting encryption for data at rest or data in motion. Basically, all your users should have unique login credentials, whereas they'll be viewing EPHI, entering data, um, and, uh, and that, therefore they can be accountable for what they're entering into the system. In addition, automatic logout or, or lockout will help uh, if there's a period of inactivity. For, so, for example, if an employee walks away from a workstation, forgets to, to manually log out, after a period of inactivity, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, the computer will automatically lock them out or log them out. I think at this point, it's a good place to stop and give you an example of an implementation specification in an actual security risk analysis. So it kind of gives you a format example of what, it, what one looks like. And we used our sample, basically how, how we set up our SRA. Uh, you can see at the top, this specification addresses a contingency plan. 
and the re recommendation basically tells you what, what we want you to do. We've assigned risk levels, and it's linked to a regulation summary. And the regulation summary is the actual law itself, but in plain language. So when you're questioning, okay, why, why do we need to do this? You go to the regulation summary, and it will explain the reasons behind the, the specification. The tip at the bottom takes you back to your HIPAA policies and procedure manual. So if you want more implementation guidance, you can go to the manual and it will give that to you. And also sometimes it'll point you in the right direction with regards to templates or forms that you need to fill out. The reference at the bottom takes you back to the actual law itself. So if you want to read the actual wording of the law, you can, you can copy and paste that into your browser and that will take you to the actual security standard that's linked to the contingency plan. Okay, so uh, let's recap what are the essential elements of the security risk analysis. We need to identify and document potential threats and vulnerabilities to your EPHI. We need to access, or I'm sorry, assess current security measures. We also need to determine the likelihood and impact of a threat, assign risk level to threats and vulnerabilities that you've identified on your SRA, develop your security risk management strategy, and conduct periodic reviews and updates to your risk analysis. Okay, now what? You know what you need to do. You know how to conduct a security risk analysis. What are your choices? Well, you can read through all the laws and you, conduct, you can conduct your own SRA. Uh, there are disadvantages to that though. The laws can be quite difficult to weed through and, and sometimes they can be confusing to interpret. The process is pretty laborious and time consuming trying to, to uh, conduct your own SRA. And if you do decide to, to go that route, can you be 100% sure if you conduct your own security risk analysis that you didn't miss anything? We recommend that you hire an expert like us who knows the laws and can conduct a comprehensive SRA providing you a site-specific written report offering you guidance and support throughout the process and got offering you support especially if you if you are chosen for a HIPAA audit. The advantages of hiring an, an expert of course is that we bring expertise to the table. We can offer a, a fresh perspective to your practice, so uh, kind of a fresh pair of eyes when we walk in when we're doing our, our evaluation of, of the practice. And hiring an expert uh, allows you not to have to reinvent the wheel. We bring all the policies and procedures and the SRA and, and, the, and the implementation tools with us to help you through the process of implementation. So if you'd like further information on this or any of, of the other HIPAA laws and regulations, I did include the link uh, to the, to the uh, HHS HIPAA page. And if you, if you get into that page, it'll uh, bring you to links to, to all the actual rules, the HIPAA uh, laws and rules. It'll also bring you to an FAQ section, which is, is quite good if you have specific questions about some of the HIPAA standards. Um, it also has resources for you, and it'll give you the latest and greatest when it comes to HIPAA news releases and bulletins. Of course, if you want help, if you think that that's the route you want to go, we do offer uh, site-specific help to our clients. So we offer um, uh, full HIPAA and OSHA compliance programs, and they are geared towards dental professionals. So. Our policies and procedures are customized to your practice. We offer on-site practice surveys and a security risk analysis with interactive on-site staff training. We'll, give, we'll provide you unlimited implementation support, and we also stand by you in the event of a, of a HIPAA and, and OSHA audit if you need so. 
Well, this concludes my overview of essential steps to completing a HIPAA security risk analysis. I want to thank you so much for your attention. And thanks again to DTC for hosting this webinar. I think I actually kept it under 30 minutes, which is great. So I'd yeah, be happy you did, to answer. you did a great job. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> as I was going to say, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. But go ahead. Heather, I'll turn it over to you. Sure, 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 sure. Again, um, if you have a, if you do have questions, you can drop them in that little chat um, box <clears throat> on uh, the right hand side of your screen, and I will um, ask Karen. I do have a couple of questions. One is, um, what is an IS activity audit, and why do I need to conduct one? An IS activity audit. So, yeah, information systems activity audit, yes, uh -huh. yes. Good question, good question. So the, the purpose of a, an activity audit is to, to regularly review access to all your IT systems that hold EPHI to make sure that they're not being used or disclosed in an inappropriate or un unauthorized way, basically. An activity audit does involve identifying all the software all the applications and databases that hold your EPHI. And if you, if you really don't know how to, to run one, oftentimes my clients will turn to their, their vendors, to uh, their software and application vendors for guidance. You can also turn to DTC. They may be able to help you in that regard as well. Okay. Um, another question is what is meant, what's encryption and why do I need it? Yeah, that's a good question, too. Encryption um, sometimes is, is a little bit confusing. So encryption is a method of basically converting an original message of, of regular text into encoded or computer language text. So the text is, is encrypted by means of what they call an algorithm, which is basically a procedure or formula. And, and if the information is encrypted, the important thing is it means that there would be a low probability that anyone other than the recipient who has the key to the code would be able to translate it. So from a HIPAA perspective, the goal of encryption is to protect EPHI from being accessed and viewed by anybody that's not authorized to do so. Yeah, and absolutely we can we can help you with that at DTC if you have any questions about that. We have a several products that we sell that are um, encrypt emails. Um, and this Good. I, this last question that I have, unless other people have more, I'm, I'm happy to stay open for, you know, during this and, and keep keep taking questions. But um, this is the last one for now. Um, and it's probably my favorite question. <laughs> is it necessary for each user logging into our computers and dental software to have their own login credentials? Yes, my favorite too, Heather. And I get a groan when I answer this. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Each user should have a unique user identifier. And that, that oftentimes is a variation on their name or something along those lines, plus a unique password or passphrase. And that allows the practice to track their activity when they're logged into the information system. Um, and, and in addition, this allows the security officer to hold users accountable for functions performed on the practice information systems. The thing is, users should be consistently accessing the system and entering data under their own login credentials. And individual login credentials should never, ever, ever be shared. Okay, so everybody uh, enters their own data under their own login. That's basically it. Um, if we have a quick second, Heather, I just wanted to kind of uh, talk about real quick the NIST, the new NIST recommendations. Do we have another minute or so? Sure, sure. Absolutely. Uh, Go ahead. Okay. It, um, this is important. So the, the, NI, uh, the NIST has published new recommendations for establishing authentication procedures when accessing IT systems. And just as um, a, a, an explanation, the National Institute for Standards and Technology is a governmental agency that develops IT processing standards that the federal government must follow. But for the public sector, they are non-mandatory, but they have become best practice recommendations throughout the security industry. So the NIST has established these new authentication procedures, which I think is great. 
they, they realize that the requirements of creating ever increasingly complex passwords and requiring users to change them periodically has really become counterproductive to good password security. So in order to promote user friendliness, the updated NIST best practice recommendations now suggest the use of what is referred to as memorized secrets. These would involve strings of at least as long as 64 characters or longer and be made up of sentences or phrases that users can easily memorize. The secret could also contain word spaces or any other character that the user prefers. The, the, the problem with these new standards is that some software and applications have not kept up with the ability to change passwords in this manner. So some dental software, some applications have very strict requirements and limitations on how long your passwords can be, what characters can be in them. So I'm hoping over time this will evolve and, and we'll all start to be able to use these, um, these memorized secrets because I think it's going to help in, um, in user compliance in the long haul. That's all I got. Great. So I, the last thing I want to just ask for me, I'll ask the question is, is this like an all or nothing process? Do you know, I feel like people feel like they may be ready to, to, you know, start working toward HIPAA compliance, but it's daunting. And, and what are, is it, do I have to go full bore into HIPAA? Um, compliance when I dip my toe in the water, you know? Uh, yeah, I'm going to have to say there's really no regulation or I'm going to say implementation specification under the security standards that you could say, well, I'll, I'll implement this, but not this one. I mean, they're pretty much all supposed to be uh, um, put into place and followed and, and, and changed as, as your business and organization evolves. So, it does sound daunting, and I understand that, um, but that's why it's really helpful to have an, a, an expert come in and help you kind of tease through everything, work through everything um, at, at, at a, your pace, and, and be able to explain what you're doing, why you're doing it, and keep you on track. So, so the answer is really yes, kind of it is all or nothing. Great. And I th yeah, I think all. Yeah, all, right? I mean... Right, unless you yes. have really good yes. insurance. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> even then, right? Okay. Even then. Well, even then. That is all of it. Those are all the questions I have, and um, also I just want to put a plea out there to our our clients that um, and everybody attending the webinar. If you have other topics that you want to see copied on these webinars, like I say, they're intended to be a value add to you. So if there's something that you're interested in. Um, or that you want more information on, just just email us and we'll we'll get an expert like Karen to talk about it. So I appreciate all of you. Uh, um, like Karen said, you know, uh, taking your lunch hour to participate in HIPAA. <laughs> um, and again, if you have any questions, contact me. Contact Karen. We're we're available. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, very much. Have all a right, good day. Have a great everyone. day. Yep. Yep.